From west to east and kingdom to kingdom, you're listening to the Diz Unplugged Connecting with Walt podcast. Connecting with Walt is brought to you by Dreams Unlimited Travel, experts at helping you plan the perfect Disney vacation. Visit them on the web at www.dreamsunlimitedtravel.com. Hello and welcome to Episode 8 of the Diz Unplugged Connecting with Walt podcast. I am your host and Diz historian, Michael Bowling. And I'm joined by my co-host and producer, Craig Williams. Hello. So, Craig, how are you tonight? Or today? I am... Today, tonight, it's all the same. Uh, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing just fine. How are you right. doing, Michael? I'm doing well. A whole lot better than I was um, last week. Yes, uh, <laughs> it's it's sad that you don't have the same rasp in your voice, but I'm sure you feel much better because of it. I do a whole lot better. Thank you. That's what's most important. Yes. <laughs> so, so anyway, well, you know, you know, listeners might not know this, but you know, Craig and I. You know, Craig and I and Carolyn Kylie were friends well before, you know, uh, connecting with Walt. But but Craig is a very complicated person. I've learned he's very complex. There are many layers to him. So so it should not have surprised me when a listener pointed out to me today that um, that that Craig, you're you're a brony. I had absolutely no idea. I I mean, it's not something I'm proud of, uh, Uh per se, but it it is something that if anyone brings it up, I would be more than happy to share my passion of My Little Pony with them. And uh, for for people who don't know me, I am also the most sarcastic person in the world. (laughs) And it's it's very hard to even try to be somewhat serious about this right now. <laughs> so I, I was thinking, because my granddaughter loves my pretty pony, my little <laughs> pony, whatever it's called. So I was thinking you're sort of probably a Pinkie Pie kind of guy. I, that's like a hyperactive <laughs> pony who loves throwing parties. I, I do know who Pinkie Pie is. <laughs> Solely okay, for the you fact, have one up on me already. <laughs> solely for the fact that not not in terms of the show or anything, but um, for uh, Finley's birthday last year, uh, Corey Martin and uh, and Julie Martin's daughter. Uh, for those of you who listen to the Disney World podcast, uh, I got her a Pinkie Pie backpack for her birthday last year. So, uh, so your uh, that's the only reason coming I, out even then. I I just chose the one that was pink. Because don't <laughs> girls like pink? I don't know. I know that's oh a stereotype, my. but... We're going to get more emails. I, I'm sure. <laughs> it's, boys can like pink, too. I'm not they saying can. they can't. Just saying, from my experience, girls seem to like pink, mm-hmm. too. Now, now, listeners, you may be wondering why we're talking about My Little Pony. And it has nothing to do with it, like Walt played, you know, polo. But because a, a <laughs> very sharp listener, Dizzer George sent me a message uh, right before the show saying I didn't know Craig was a brony. So I inquired a little more because I did know what a brony was and and asked, what do you mean? And and I was sent a Time Warner uh, cable, I guess, commercial. uh, And in it, they would they had uh, they were showing some of the different television shows they have on Time Warner and every time they showed My Little Pony our beloved Connecting with Walt podcast theme song played over My Little Pony so so that's when your secret was out Craig it's because Craig chose the theme music. I told him sort of what I wanted, the feel I wanted, but but Craig ultimately chose it. And it was I mean, it was just absolutely hilarious because I was sitting down uh, at my desk to to start getting everything ready that I needed to do to record the show and get ready for it. And I, I saw your email come in as I was about ready to pull up the script for this episode and and look over it. And I genuinely, with the text that you wrote, I don't have the email up right now, but it made me think that you might actually be be like upset about the music and i didn't watch the video at that point so i I have no idea what's even going on and then i saw it and you have got to be kidding me this this did happen once before because uh, all the music that we use not all of it a a majority of the music we use is uh, music that we 
we we pay for the license so that way uh, we we can use it in a lot of our creative videos and uh two years back i uh i picked a song for a video i did and then it ended up in like this corporate video about how to how to refinance your loans (laughs) <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, I, I used it as a really emotional song to try to get people invested in what was happening. And it's just being thrown around for for some guy who essentially turned a, a PowerPoint onto about loans onto a video. And, well, and a different used kind it, of so. investment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, I, I always enjoy hearing whenever our music pops up in something else. Uh, the fact that it had to deal with My Little Pony this time around isn't flattering either but one time i'll hear one of our songs in a movie or something really intense <laughs> that'd be funny ted nugent playing the dis unplug theme song or something yeah. I, <laughs> I yeah i i don't like it's with, especially with the trip because uh mm-hmm. for everyone who knows about the trip one of our our podcasts on in the dis unplug network it's it's just got this like standard rock song to it that I know will pop up somewhere at some point. If it, if it hasn't already, we might not have been the original ones with it, but it, it's always scary. Anyway, well, well, you know, folks, now you'll never listen to um, Connecting with Walt quite the same again. Yeah, I'll make sure <laughs> to put that uh, video in the show notes so everyone can see yes. what we're actually talking about. And we have no financial uh, ties with um time warner exactly yes <laughs> so if you hate their service don't blame us yeah. <laughs> so anyway well speaking of connecting with walt um you may remember in episode seven pursuing the dream without the dreamer craig and i examined how walt disney's passing in december 1966 impacted the creative course of the entire disney world project and the legal and political hurdles walt disney productions had to overcome to get the legislation passed needed to begin work on the florida project So today in episode eight, Up the Creek, Craig and I are going to explain the significance of the Reedy Creek Improvement District. So in his famous Epcot film that was shown to the public two months after his passing, Walt said, here in Florida, we have something special that we never enjoyed at Disneyland, the blessing of size. There's enough land here to hold all the ideas and plans we can possibly imagine. Walt Disney World is located within the Walt Disney Company's Reedy Creek Improvement District, which is a Disney-controlled and owned area separate from any cities in Florida. The district allows Disney a tremendous amount of autonomy. Now, as we discussed in our previous episode, the Reedy Creek Improvement District was created on May 12, 1967, when Florida Governor Claude Kirk signed legislation creating a special taxing district to govern, govern a 25,000-acre area of Central Florida that was considered remote and an uninhabitable by most Floridians and a few Disney executives. Uh, the Reedy Creek Improvement District is named after a natural drainage area on the property. And the Reedy Creek Improvement District governs nearly every aspect of Walt's Florida property. The Reedy Creek Improvement District is the actual legal name for the entire Florida property, whilst the public and resort guests refer to the district as Walt Disney World. The Disney theme parks inside the property are only components of the Reedy Creek Improvement District, and the theme parks and resorts do not exist or act independently. So the idea of a special district taking responsibility for all the services normally associated with county government, like um, water, power, uh, emergency services, waste disposal, roads, bridges, you know, went beyond any special district that had ever been created in Florida. So another new concept was the idea that the landowners within the district, in this case primarily the Walt Disney World Company, would agree to pay all costs for those services. Local taxpayers, meaning residents of Orange County and Osceola County, would not have to contribute. 
So the district was given many of the same powers as a municipality, such as the right to own property and the right to maintain a corporate seal. But however, it also provides less typical powers, including the authority to exercise eminent domain outside of its jurisdictional boundaries. Um, other powers granted to the district include many typically held by a municipality, uh, such as the uh, authority and responsibilities to provide government services, such as land use regulation and planning, building codes, surface water control, drainage, pest control, waste treatment, utilities, roads, bridges, fire protection, emergency medical services, environmental services, and the issuance of bonds. The legislation also empowered the district to have authority in other less typical acts, such as operating an airport and heliport for passenger and freight service. And the authority, this authority was needed since Walt Disney's plans for the city of the future included a jet port. So Disney did build a stall port for short takeoffs and landings, which is what stall is, at the resort, and that opened on October 17th, 1971. So in the short time this landing strip operated, Shawnee and Executive Airlines operated passenger flights from Orlando and Tampa to Walt Disney World on small passenger turboprop planes. An ultralight flight park um, near Epcot Center was built for private non-passenger services, and both of these landing strips were eventually abandoned. Um, one helipad still remains in the backstage area of Epcot near the Living Seas Pavilion. And I think the, um, I thought the stall runway was still there as well, because I once, we were driving and we took a wrong turn, and we ended up on a, um, on an airport runway, but it looked like they were parking um, Disney buses um, in that area, including ones that clearly would never run again. I mean, do you know what I'm talking about, Craig? Okay, the uh, the stall port, that's the one that's right before you would make the turn to like Wilderness Lodge, if you're like th- going through the Magic Kingdom main gates and then I think it's so. off to the right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, if I, I believe that's the stall port. I always get it confused because I know too that like in all the things we've talked about how uh Walt Disney wanted an airport further down by uh further down by like the Kissimmee area, but in terms of on property, yeah, there was uh a, an airport where there is I believe just one runway, maybe two. Uh did you say that? You didn't say that just right here. Um but uh, yeah, you can you can actually still get onto it if you have a car and you're driving. Uh, it's a lot of times it's used for like overflow parking with construction or as you said, buses, uh, cast members. You never know what's going to be parked in that area, and uh, because it's just a long, it lo- it looks like a long road that just goes to nowhere. Right. So it's it's easy to drive onto it, and it's one of those things. If you didn't know that it was a runway, you you wouldn't know it all. And uh, for those of you out there who are big Adam the Woo fans, he did have a video, I believe, after he was allowed back on Disney World property just this past uh, last year, and he did go to the the stall port as as long as that's the exact one I'm thinking of. So. I will. Uh, I'll try to find that video and track it down and add it to the show notes because, regardless, it's it's awesome. Oh, okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, and I think the airport that Walt Disney wanted to build was going to be in the area where Celebration is. Exactly. Now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So one of the recurrent themes in this legislation was the granting of broad powers to the district for experimental technologies outside of conventional norms. So as an example, one section of the legislation reads, in order to promote the development and utilization of new concepts, designs, and ideas in the fields of recreation and community living, the district shall have the power and authority to examine into, develop, and utilize new concepts, designs, and ideas, and to own, acquire, construct, reconstruct, equip, operate, maintain, extend, 
and improve such experimental public facilities and services as the board may from time to time determine. So the Florida legislature and Walt Disney Productions conceived of a project that operated as a conventional municipality while possessing a broad scope of authority to approach governance in a unique manner. This is exactly as Walt Disney had anticipated would be needed to accomplish his unique project of building a city of the future. So the enabling legislation provided for a five-member board of supervisors elected by property owners to govern the district. Um, The board of supervisors, each of whom had to be a landowner in the district, and a majority had to be residents of Osceola, Orange, or an adjoining county um, to serve a four-year term. And this board would be in charge of levying taxes and imposing fees within the boundaries. And that money would pay for all the services the Reedy Creek Improvement District would provide. And the board would also communicate with local, regional, state, and federal regulatory agencies on matters that cross jurisdictional lines. And this provision meant that non-landowner residents, such as renters or landowners who own less than one half acre, would not be entitled to vote in board elections. So these Board of Supervisor members who are senior employees of the Walt Disney Company each own an undeveloped five acres of land within the district. And the only land in the district not technically controlled by Disney or used for public road purposes. So the only residents of the district who are also Disney employees or their immediate family members live in two small communities one in each city. In the 2000 census, Bay Lake had 23 residents, all in the community on the north shore of Bay Lake. And Lake Buena Vista had 16 residents, all in the community about a mile north of downtown Disney. And these residents elect the officials of the cities, but since they don't actually own any land, they don't have any power in electing the district board of supervisors. Yes, yeah, so, and I think, again, when we were driving around, I stumbled upon one of the cities. I think it must have been the city of Bay Lake, because I think it was, it was not far from the Magic Kingdom, and, and city was being generous. Yeah. Um, I, I think it was, like, trailers. <laughs> I absolutely believe that. I, I genuinely was not really that aware of it i mean it's it's one of those things as local you don't you don't necessarily really think about that um as you're driving through it's just houses and houses and houses like anywhere else but um i'm gonna try to look up stuff more on that right now as we're talking about this oh good okay yeah jump right in when you find something Uh. Um, the legislation established uh, these two municipalities within the district, uh, the city of Bay Lake and the city of Reedy Creek. Um, these cities have typical municipal powers, but Disney essentially controls the governance of both cities uh, by limiting their residents to small groups of Disney employees and their families. Uh, however, these two cities do possess some powers that the district does not. And it includes the authority to issue business and professional licenses and to collect fees related to them. And they can build and maintain health care facilities, including hospitals and health care research facilities, can provide police services, regulate the manufacturing and sale of alcohol, establish and operate a municipal court, including appointment of a municipal judge, and city prosecutor. Now, Disney elected not to have its own municipal court system or police force, instead allowing Orange County and Osceola County to respond to incidents. So the approximately 800 security staff are instead considered employees of the Walt Disney Company. So arrests and citations are issued by the Florida Highway Patrol, along with the Orange County and Osceola County Sheriff's um, deputies who patrol the roads. 
Disney security does maintain a fleet of security vans equipped with flares and traffic cones, and these security personnel are charged with traffic control by the Reedy Creek Improvement District and may only issue personnel, personnel violation notices to Disney and Reedy Creek Improvement District employees, but not to the general public. Now, Reedy Creek does maintain an internal fire department and paramedic service for incidents on its property. And Reedy Creek employees do wear their own name tags, just as Disney employees do. The Reedy Creek name tags are produced in plastic and metal. So one of the few areas of government Disney did not obtain authority over was a school system. The company did announce plans for a School of Tomorrow as part of the City of Tomorrow project, but repeatedly assured local and state authorities that it had no intention of operating a school system. At the 1967 Winter Park event we spoke about in our last episode, it was announced that the company would not operate an entire school system, but it would provide support for experimental school programs within the existing school's frameworks. So despite the legislation being passed and signed into law, it was soon tested in the courts to determine if it was in compliance with Florida's constitution. So Craig, did you dig up anything? Um, I, I still can't figure out where these small houses are um, at all. So I, I found the update that in... I mean, this comes via Wikipedia, but it's still, it's census information. So, um, as of 2010 for the census, it's up to 47 people. So, always growing. Oh. Um, and it's estimated that as of 2014, there is 49 people a part of Bay Lake. Um, it's growing metropolis. I, I know, right? <laughs> so, I just... I, I, I'm still baffled by it. That I, I know the general areas that it is, but I guess I've just always ignored what's actually there and assumed it was part of something else. But um, I'm going to have to do a little on-ground looking, so we'll pause the podcast now and I'll go drive out in the dark. <laughs> we'll pick this up in a with couple your, hours. With your big um, searchlight that exactly. you have on, yeah. on your car. Exactly. If you see a Honda Civic <laughs> driving around with... Uh, with a giant light on top. That's me. Yes. <laughs> so, as mentioned in our previous episode, after the legislation was passed, project planning for Disney World moved quickly to meet the 1971 opening date. However, in early 1968, Disney met up with a new challenge, a strike by the local 678 of the International Union of Operating Engineers to demand higher pay and improved working conditions on the Disney World site. So the Orlando Sentinel reported that the strike had resulted in violence between union and non-union workers. In an article, they wrote, more than 20 non-union construction workers were marched military style from the west side of the 27,400-acre Disney World plot by 300 union members who roughed up one man. The non-union workers were forced to chant, The union wins, we won't be back again, as they walked off. Now, the Disney company had anticipated the strike and remained committed to the project as the strike went on. So on February 13, 1968, state and local union leaders organized an anti-Disney rally at Orlando's Tangerine Bowl. And organizers expected a crowd of 20 to 50,000, but around 6,000 showed up. And the rally ended after 45 minutes. The organizers then invited all attendees to the Disney Project site to continue the rally. This effort failed as few members wanted to make the 23-mile ride from the Tangerine Bowl to the Disney Project site. On Friday, February 16th, Disney and union officials announced an end to the 32-day strike, with parties reaching an interim pact on wages and other benefits. However, Walt Disney Productions faced a far more serious legal challenge. Would the Florida State Supreme Court uphold the constitutionality of Disney's unique form of improvement district governance? 
So the case of the state of Florida versus Reedy Creek Improvement District centered on the propriety of allowing the Reedy Creek Improvement District to issue drainage bonds as part of its redevelopment plan. The revenue from this issuance of bonds would be used to drain and reclaim submerged land within the district. The maturity dates for the bonds ranged from 1970 until 2004. And the state, which had authorized the district through the 1967 legislation, was challenging the scope of the authority granted to the district. So this would be an important legal test for Disney's unique structure within the Florida courts. Mm -hmm. Technically... This is sort of where it gets uh, a little convoluted. Reedy Creek had filed the lawsuit against the state of Florida and property owners and citizens within the district. Since Disney was the force behind the district, they were suing themselves as owners of most of the property in the district. So why, you might ask? Because before Disney could market these bonds, they needed to determine if the bonding authority granted by the state legislature was legal under Florida's constitution. So by Disney filing this suit, it would bring the matter before the Florida Supreme Court for a final ruling. So the initial trial court's hearing was pretty much a charade between the two parties, so the case would ultimately go before the state Supreme Court. So the Florida Supreme Court ultimately held up the trial court's validation of the drainage bonds and the very structure of the district itself. So the years of legal and regulatory planning that had produced the Reedy Creek Improvement District had been validated. So the legality of Reedy Creek Improvement District was now official. Okay. That is very convoluted. Oh, and and believe me, I have given you the Reader's Digest version of this. I, I mean, I I read pages and pages on this, and it it was very complex. Well, I I personally thank you for that. I'm sure there's other people out there who's interested in it, and maybe one day we can make a director's cut of this where <laughs> you, you do read out loud every single part. Yes, yes I'll sit in a, in my Mickey, in my big Mickey chair with you know my glasses at the edge of my nose. Oh and yeah, I am smoking jacket. Okay, we'll we'll get like a dim light just yes. right over your shoulder that really Sipping set the mood exactly. <laughs> so anyway, well, however. Disney's legal bills continued to mount. So on August 5th, 1968, a civil lawsuit was filed by the Florida Ranchlands alleging fraud by Disney and Buzz Prices company ERA, suing for damages it claimed to have suffered in lost real estate commissions. Um, The allegations dated back to William Lund's original trip for ERA in December 1963, to investigate potential sites for the Florida project, and we talked about this in the early episodes of Connecting with Walt. Um, Disney's instructions to Price, Lund, and ERA for keeping Disney's identity secret was very clear. However, the instructions regarding how Lund was to conduct his investigations were apparently not as clear. Whilst visiting Florida, Lund had met with Florida Ranch Land's personnel as part of his disguised role on behalf of a New York investment group seeking property in Florida. So the lawsuit claimed that during these visits and related conversations between Lund and Florida Ranch Lands, or FRL, Disney had become aware of the Dimitri Bay Lake and Hammock properties that would later be purchased as a significant portion of Disney's Florida project. So FRI alleged that Lund used the information they provided, gave it to Disney, who then purchased a Dimitri property without paying a commission to FRL for its work. So again, the facts surrounding the lawsuit intertwined with the complex efforts Disney took to keep their identity a secret. And it it was all of this uh, people using assumed names with assumed company names, um, being fronted by uh, names, uh, you know, real companies that Disney had hired to represent them. And it, again, there's pages and pages of this. Oh yeah, and I mean, it it worked out so well that obviously it's the history's repeating itself in Orlando, uh, as it started back in December with uh, 
Universal trying to buy up land on International Drive using using another company to to front the entire procedure. Now, is that the land they just purchased? They still haven't. It's their Universal hasn't come out and say they purchased it, um, and that they were going to do anything with it. But it's basically understood that the company that was buying it for universal did purchase it and then it just has to be taken over by universal okay now is that the one where the universal had fought to prevent a, sort of like a yeah i the, don't know a, a, an attraction right next to the property yeah they are building what's called skyplex orlando uh it right in the general area of where Universal was buying up all this land. And essentially, uh, Skyplex is going to be this giant, giant tower with the world's largest roller coaster on it. And it's, you know, Universal used a lot of, um, a lot of kind of false fights against it, saying, you know, it had to deal with that it's going to ruin the skyline of the entire area. It's going to cause traffic issues. It's going to cause noise problems, um, all, all of which is probably true, not to the point that they were arguing uh, that it would really have an effect. But um, it, it, it comes down to if they were able to control the land that Skyplex it, Skyplex is actually being built on, then it would be able to help further connect into the land that they were planning on buying and create uh, just a, a massive amount of land. And, you know, they're, they're still going to go through with their efforts um, in terms of buying land, even though they're going to have Skyplex Orlando in its way. But, yeah, they, they really wanted to monopolize as much as they could on this area. But... Um, the fact that they they were using this company to start drumming up interest in terms of buying the land it's it's just brilliant that they took a play out of disney's book from years and years and years before and it made is, it relevant yeah. again yeah yeah so so like you're saying that you know people were were had worked under assumed names in shell companies and all that, and it was only after the announcement that Disney was the secret land purchaser, and several articles published listing the names of the Disney representatives who were involved, FRL realized that they were they had dealt with all these people that were named in in these articles, and they concluded that they were owed a commission on the Dimitri property. So the suit alleged that Disney and ERA owed FRL uh, $200,000 in commissions for the Dimitri Bay Lake and Hamrick tracks. And Walt Disney Productions moved to have the complaint dismissed for failure to allege a proper claim. The court disagreed with Disney and denied the dismissal notion, motion. So Disney's defense was based on several points. Firstly, it claimed that its November 1963 agreement with ERA did not authorize Lund to do anything more than informally investigate large land transactions in Florida. Um, his efforts in engaging FRL to identify actual parcels, pricing, and availability exceeded the scope of ERA's agreement with Disney. So as a result, Disney was not responsible for Lund's unapproved conduct. Um, Disney also argued it never used any of the information received from Lund or FRL regarding the Dimitri Bay Lake or Hamrick tracts. So in anticipation that the subterfuge Disney had used in their representatives disguising their true identities might become an issue, Disney claimed these actions were not fraudulent and they were done in accordance with the Security Exchange Act. Since it was a public corporation, the act allowed it to withhold the true identities of Foster and Lund to protect its shareholders from increased financial costs. The company would have realized had its true identity become known during the land acquisition process. So basically, Disney was claiming its deception was done in accordance with federal law. Mm -hmm. So, um, just like Congress. Yeah, well, it's a, <laughs> it sounds like a, a solid argument to me. Yeah. Yeah, so deposition after deposition was taken over several months, and each side became more contentious. 
George Young, the presiding federal court judge, finally set a case for trial on June 9, um, 1969, before a jury in Orlando. However, before a jury could rule on the matter, both parties reached a confidential settlement over the summer, with all parties dismissing their claims and defenses. Regrettably, one of the results of this lawsuit was that it created distance between Walt Disney Productions and Buzz Price. I mean, Buzz was devoted to Walt Disney, was devoted to the Disney Company. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and Walt Disney, who had encouraged Price to start ERA, was gone, you know, leaving ERA without its strongest advocate in the company. Um, plus, the remaining Disney executives were convinced the fault of the entire lawsuit was due to Lund acting outside the scope of Disney's November 1963 agreement with ERA. So although ERA continued to do some work for Disney, Buzz Price ultimately sold the company and was not part of the company's inner circle as it prepared to build the Florida project. And it would be decades before the company reconciled with Price. Um, he, He was named a Disney legend in 2003, and he had a window on Disneyland Main Street USA dedicated to him three years after his passing. Yeah, I guess I I don't... I mean, obviously, I'm not the expert in all of this, but I don't understand how it all created such a wedge in between Buzz Price and the Disney company. You know, I, I think because the Disney company was so concerned because they were still trying to obtain financing and things like that they they were so frightened of any financial scandals that I think they felt they had to distance themselves from um, Buzz Price and ERA as much as they could okay yeah um. and I, I mean that's just sort of my my speculation on it so yeah, and, and I, I I saw Buzz Price um shortly before he passed away at the Walt Disney Family Museum. And again, he's, he was not bitter, still had um, you know, nothing but fond memories of Walt, of Roy. And uh, I mean, he was up there in age, so you know, his, his um, memories failed him just a bit. But uh, still just, you know, just, uh, you know the, the love of the company and that he was a part of its history just you could tell meant a great deal to him and he also really carried on Walt's dream of Cal Arts yeah and and he you know he definitely wa- um, made sure that happened and that was something he was very proud of yeah and that's um, I'm, that, that is the important part and you know it, it's kind of it, it does make you happy to hear that despite everything that kind of happened after Walt um he was able to to still be okay with everything and that probably has a lot to do with the fact that he was so close to Walt whenever he was and it it just it it's an attest it's a testament to Walt's character and uh almost confirms why we're all okay with being so obsessed with Walt because deep down yeah. he he touched the people that worked with him and he's touched all of us who it never had the chance to meet him. Well, except for you, but yeah, briefly. You know. But yeah, but yeah, there is a tremendous amount to admire in Walt, yeah. and that, and that that just went a long way with people yeah. who worked with him. So now, with all these legal hurdles conquered, uh, Walt Disney Productions is now ready to move forward in completing the first phase of the Disney World project, which included identifying key participants in building the resort. So on February 11th, 1969, Disney announced that it signed a three-year agreement with the Allen Contracting Company to serve as the general contractor. Uh, Disney also announced it had entered into an agreement with the Bank of America and seven Florida banks for a $50 million credit line to begin construction. And on April 30th, 1969, Disney hosted a large political and press gatherings, actually a series of them, to announce significant portions of the project. And during the four-day event in Orlando, Disney unveiled large models of the resort, presented a 17-minute overview film, um, and they displayed artists' renderings for the resort. 
Governor Kirk joined with Disney executives for the event to announce that several major U.S. corporations would be participating in the construction of the project, including U.S. Steel, RCA, and Monsanto. And this meeting also revealed details that would never be built or would be significantly changed by the time they were built. For example, Disney employees associated with the project were still referring to the planned Polynesian Resort as a 12-story building. And and as we know, the final version of the resort would be a series of two- and three-story buildings. But it's it's kind of uh, interesting that whenever all of those... um, all of the DVC rumors started to pop up uh, way back when before. Obviously, now we do have the DVC bungalows and the DVC building at the Polynesian. But at one point in time, someone else brought that rumor back up that uh, to accommodate DVC at Polynesian, they might actually re re come back to the idea of a 12-story building. Not, not necessarily 12-story, but but a larger, uh, more vertical building in that area to accommodate all the people who would want to take part in it. So hmm. um, sometimes, you know, that might just have been a rumor that someone went and read back uh, knowing that that was planned at one point in time and thought it would be fun to stir the pot. But uh, yeah. if Disney... That would be... Sorry. No, go ahead. No, if Disney did try to reconsider something like that uh, nowadays, it would... Uh, it would be interesting to see if they'd reconsider any of the other resorts that you're just about to mention right now. Yeah. Well, it, the interesting thing is is that visually a, a taller building at the Polynesian, that would that would be interesting. It, it wouldn't make it's, sense uh, no. with the Polynesian that we know and love, but at the same time, uh, y- you and I have both been to Alani and... Uh, you're getting... Oh, I haven't been yet, oh, but I will okay. be in a couple months. I thought you have already been. I knew that you were having your trip coming up, but um, okay, well, you will understand that uh, whenever you get to see it finally, that uh, despite it not being the same look and feel as the Polynesian as well, that same spirit is in the building. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously, Alani is very, very large and very vertical, and uh, I think although it would have to be planned in the perfect place at the Polynesian to be added to, to what's there currently, I still think that that could be something that could be put in at this date and time, and, and they could make it work if they wanted to. Yeah. Well, some uh, an, an, another thing, other things that were not built but were in planning was the Asian, Venetian, and Persian-themed resorts around the Central Lagoon. Now, those were still being discussed at this time, but ultimately would be three projects that would never be built. Uh, this also applied to Disney World's theme park, the Magic Kingdom. The April 1969 plans included several major features that would not be constructed, uh, most famously Thunder Mesa, featuring a new dark ride attraction called the Western River Expedition. This would be larger in scale and more complex than Disneyland's Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. And someday, and connecting with Walt, we will... We'll have segments on some of the, um, you know, never built, yes, you know, realms and and attractions of Walt Disney World. So look forward to that. Yeah. Now, despite this, the plans Walt Disney Productions revealed at this April event would be what Walt Disney World guests would find on opening day. Now, Disney theme park fans may think or wish that eventually all the land within the Reedy Creek Improvement District will be developed, with more theme parks, resorts, and entertainment districts. But that will never happen, as Reedy Creek has set aside many thousands of acres to remain as undeveloped wilderness. Another important part of the district's mission is to protect and conserve the wildlife and natural resources within its boundaries. The many species of plants and animals within the district thrive on its undeveloped lands. Exactly, and that's something that gets brought up a lot whenever uh, everyone talks about, well, there's always room for more theme parks. There's always, there's still so much land there that's undeveloped that they could use for that. But, um, you know, it's, there. while they do have room to add on a little bit more, uh, at the same time, they they do have to leave some of this this undeveloped land there and well wasn't it 
was it for Disney Hollywood Studios when they announced the you know the latest expansion? They were expanding into areas that had been set aside to be undeveloped, so they had to they set aside even more land elsewhere. I think that and and mark that as undeveloped. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and they're actually moving any critters they find are actually going to transport. Yes, I mean over. I, I hope it's no alligators or anything like that. Uh, I don't like those. Um, but, yeah, no, they, they have run into obstacles with that. But, you know, the, there's just, with the way that park is right now, uh, they do have to expand out in order to accommodate the things that they do want to make. And, yeah, just just right across from the, the main entrance road uh, that you're supposed to use to come off of I-4 to get onto Hollywood Studios. There's there's a ton of undeveloped land right across the road there that, that fell into this, but it's with, with everything they're doing, too, with rerouting the traffic going into the actual park and, and the new parking areas that will be located there, it's it's just impossible to not not hit some of that. But I don't, I don't know if 5, 10 years ago heck even 20 years ago i don't think any of this was ever an option for hollywood studios to ever touch this land um maybe in maybe in the back of the mind of some imagineer out there but i think the general consensus was the park is what it was Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah i mean that was always the talk i heard that it was pretty locked in yeah to its site between the roads and and then the land that had been set aside. Well, so it's it, who knows. I I've I've seen a couple different plans for how everything's going to look when it's all said and done. So things could change even beyond that in terms of what land they're actually touching and what they're not mm-hmm. they're not going to use. So it's it's up to Disney in the end to figure out this crazy crazy work they're doing out there. <laughs> So, in the end, the greatest contribution of the Florida Project to Walt Disney's legacy may not be the theme parks, resorts, and the technology created to operate them all, but instead the investment made to protect Reedy Creek's natural resources, an investment that the Walt Disney Company has thoughtfully managed ever since Walt decided to build a city of tomorrow in the middle of a Florida swamp. This is a legacy stretching back to Walt Disney's first true life adventure films. So, so that's that's in a nutshell what the Reedy Creek Improvement District is. Yeah, it's so, and it it goes even beyond that. So, I I still don't know a ton about it. Uh, one of the one of our friends from. Uh, for the from the show and all of our shows and we've we've met him several times at uh, some of the meets that have happened in the the northeast for our give kids the world meet is actually now a reedy creek uh employee so he just recently got a job here and moved down and is a part of reedy creek so i'm hoping to pick his brain a little bit more and find out uh, more of the dealings behind everything uh that's involved well, with reedy us- creek Maybe he'll give us a tour of of Reedy Creek and its vast holdings. I'll have to I'll have to see what I can throw out there to bargain <laughs> to get him to give us some access to all that information out there. Well, maybe he's a brony too. And he's like, <laughs> you know, us us bronies, <laughs> we try to stick together as much as possible. Yeah. So, uh, but and now it's it, I there's only so much information that's out there for it and. Uh, Hopefully, hopefully later down the the road, more and more people write about it and and get this information out there, so we can learn more and more about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, though. Yeah, well, it's extremely interesting. It's all it's all just fascinating, even how they still work to this day and uh, control Walt Disney World. Yep. Well, next week in episode nine designing a whole new world craig and i will talk with david younger author of theme park design and the art of themed entertainment about the science and art of designing a theme park 
some of the things we'll talk about is why Disneyland is considered the first theme park and not Knott's Berry Farm. The different approaches the Imagineers took in designing the Magic Kingdom in Epcot Center, which is Disney's first park without a castle. And his advice um, for our younger Dizzers with dreams of becoming a theme park designer. So that that should be an interesting episode. So I hope you'll all join us. I, I absolutely can't wait for that episode. So not only our first guest star, but also a, a fascinating topic that is mm-hmm. a little bit out of the realm of everything that we've been discussing up to this point on the show. But it, it all is just it, it fits in so brilliantly. And I think it will be the uh, the perfect way to to leave January behind and connecting with Walt until we pick it back up in April. Right, exactly. Yep. So many books, films, articles, interviews, and lectures were sourced for this episode of Connecting with Walt, including Project Future, the inside story behind the creation of Disney World by Chad Denver Emerson, and Since the World Began, Walt Disney World, the first 25 years by Jeff Curdy. And if you would like to know more about Buzz Price and his vital contributions to Disneyland, Walt Disney World, and Cal Arts, um, please listen to my Windows on Main Street episode with Disney author Sam Genoway as we talk about Buzz Price on the April 11th, 2013 episode of the Dis Unplugged podcast Disneyland edition. And we will have a link to that episode in our show notes. Yes, we will. So, Craig, until our next episode, where can our listeners hear your golden vocal tones? Uh, of course, you can find me on uh, every other Dis Unplugged show that's out there right now, <laughs> essentially, except for the Disneyland show. Uh, yeah, I'm on the Disney World show, uh, trying to run the controls and everything that goes along with that. I'm hosting the Universal show. Uh, I'm on the trip trying to keep all the ladies in line. And... Uh, Dreams Unlimited Travel show uh, with Dreams Unlimited Travel. I'm uh, I'm helping out small contributions on that. Nothing too too amazing right now, but uh, yeah, you you can find me on all of those places as well as in the parks, uh, all around Orlando. Just look for me. It's hard to miss. I'm a big, tall, goofy guy <laughs> with his little um, Pinkie Pie backpack. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> all I. Just don't, don't, if you see me, just take a picture of it and just leave me alone, though. Um, don't, just respect my, uh, my privacy with my pinky pie. Uh, so you're a lot like <laughs> Fluttershy. Yes. Who's a shy and timid Pegasus pony who's fond of nature and takes care of animals. I, sure. Is, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> And you can find me every Sunday night on the Diz Unplugged podcast, Disneyland Edition, with my good friends Tom Bell, Nancy Johnson, Mary Jo Mulatto Willie, and Tony Spatel. We have lots of fun talking about Walt's Park that started it all, and all the other Southern California theme parks, and the Walt Disney Family Museum. Um, listen to us live on Mixler, Sundays at 7 p.m. Pacific Time, Disneyland Time. You can download our two weekly shows from iTunes on Mondays. And if you'd like to listen to more shows on the history of Walt Disney, his studio, his Imagineers, and Disneyland, check out our Disneyland podcast archives for my Disney history episodes. And Craig, where can our listeners find these shows and even more? All of our shows are found at disunplug.com. Just uh, follow the navigation to whatever show you are trying to look for and you'll be able to see and uh, specifically for a lot of michael's uh disney history episodes um we have a link in the show notes every week to uh to basically the most accurate compiled list of every history episode he's done so far so you'll be able to go directly to that i know it's a lot of bouncing around uh but we are awful in terms of <laughs> organizing all this stuff and trying to make it better but uh there's only so many hours in the day so eventually we'll have them all in one place to make things easier but uh trying to make it easiest as as much as possible for the time being yeah as soon as we have enough material i know we're looking at having a history section on the dis unplugged one day one day one day (laughs) in your free moments yes (laughs) And you can send me messages at michael at wdwinfo.com. I'm on Twitter at mbowling121. 
Facebook, I'm Michael Bowling, and on Instagram, I'm Michael Bowling the Diz. So thank you for making us a part of your day. And remember, I only hope that we don't lose sight of one thing, that it was all started by a man, Walt Disney, and his brother Roy. 